everyone, this is Jan Kabili with Ron Clifford, Dave Dell, and our special guest, Richard Harrington, for episode 60 of the Photoshop Show. How are you all doing tonight? Good. Great. Great. I know our guest, Richard, is really being a trooper, as Ron called him tonight, aren't you, Rich? What happened to you? Uh, yeah, so no, just uh, the, the short version is, is I uh, had an ACL injury from 22 years ago, finally decide that... Uh, the repair was old enough, so uh, yeah, it <laughs> went out at a very inconvenient time. So my knee is about the size of a grapefruit, and uh, I'm sitting on a couch. And the uh, the oxycodone was taken about three hours ago, so I think I'm at that peak lull of balance between <laughs> lucidity and uh, pain. So hopefully, everything I share with you will be interesting and not drug induced. <laughs> yeah, well, I've heard pain, pain can. Pain can increase your focus. That's what I've heard. So let's yeah, kind of hope that's the case. We'll see how it goes. So you know, if I just if I if I kind of slip off, Jan, feel free to translate at any point. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you doing this. I'm just awed that you're doing it, and and thank you. You're really kind. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but before you do anything, you can relax for a few minutes while we say hi to Ron Clifford and Dave Bell. Dave Bell's been traveling, right, Dave? Yeah, I took a quick weekend trip to New York to do a concert, but. Uh... I saw a whole lot of uh, airports and traffic and not a whole lot of anything else, but uh, I had a good time. So, so what are these concerts? Oh, uh, I'm in a vocal group I've been singing with for, what, what 32 years. Um, small vocal group, seven singers. And um, we go out about twice a, week, twice a month um, to anywhere all over the world. Next month will be London. So. Really? Yeah. I hope it's more than 36 hours to long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it'll be a few days. Well, that's really exciting. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and what else? Uh, Ron, what have you been doing? Um, uh, well, like you recently, I've been, um, since coming back from California, I've been really busy um, with the Arcanum and then getting some things set up for a fall workshop and then um, getting, trying to get, you know, when you're doing workshops and you want to get them posted early, and then it just doesn't get there. And so now I got a workshop coming up, and literally in in uh, the either I'm not sure which weekend to put it on, right at the end of September, the beginning of October. That should have been up weeks ago. Haven't done it yet, but it's a uh, off-camera flash workshop focusing on speed lights, but not exclusive to that. And we're going to be we we'll have a couple models, and we're going to do it in one of the graffiti alleys in Toronto. Oh, that'll, and be, that'll fun. be a lot of fun. And then um, the Arcanum is taking some time. I'm just having an incredible time working with my cohort of amazing, amazing up-and-coming photographers. Um, and uh, I, just, I just can't get over the communities that get built, um, not just in my own cohort that we call, but in the other cohorts that I uh, am privileged to be, be looking into as this thing takes off. Um, some of the relationships that are getting built and some of the things that are getting worked on are just phenomenal. It's uh, wonderful to see ideas come together in a community environment like that, rather than just you know that kind of oh well, I'll go watch a video and learn something. So yeah, that's yeah. cool. I mean, you know, the, this idea that you can learn something just by one way uh, ticket is difficult. People always have to practice, and if you can practice with other people, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, I think it's really awesome how much people are helping each other you know it's not it's not flowing just straight down from the master to the apprentice there's so much back and forth between the you know pe people wanting to help each other and I think that's really uh, and learning from each other well, it's that's like great. crowd crowdsourcing it's really cool <laughs> um Good. Well, I'm glad everybody's been busy, and it's a uh, hot summer everywhere, I know. So um, it's really hot here in Colorado, like boiling hot. But even so, I've been teaching, and I'm, this is, I've been doing an interesting thing of writing an instructor guide to go along with that book that I wrote, The Classroom in a Book. And um, it's, you know, I thought, oh, well, I've already written everything I had to say. What am I going to write in an instructor guide? I didn't realize there is so much, right? I mean, about the, it's different to talk about... Uh, content and then to talk about how to teach the content. It's a whole other subject, so it's really fun and you know good to put one's thoughts down. Now, did not I see a link to something that there was access to a, a specific Lightroom chapter in the book? Did I see oh, that? Yeah. 
Yeah, you're right. Thank you for so yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's peachpit.com, which is Peach Pit Press's website, and they just took a chapter out of the book and posted it. Wow. So yeah. you get the whole chapter on Lightroom um, for free. So that's yeah, really it's cool. all it, it's a it's free and it's cool. It's the chapter on the develop module, which has tons of stuff in it. You know, I took a photo and just basically took it all the way through the develop module through the um, you know, in the order that I would do it. And you know what? I've changed my opinion, by the way. I don't just start at the top of the develop module and go through the panels in order anymore. There's a better order than that. <laughs> so uh, that's what I did in that chapter and then used a bunch of local adjustment tools to show those off. And boy, you know, I'm sure you've done this, Ron. The hardest thing is finding one example that will work for everything, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that, if you managed to do it, congratulations, you're my hero. <laughs> it's just really hard. <laughs> Sometimes you end up shooting a photo specifically to show off a technique. I have people ask me sometimes, like, where'd you find that? I'm like, I purposely shot that wrong just to get those <laughs> results. But you have to be pretty organized to find something that will show everything. That's really hard to do. And it's really fortunate. I just have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of photos to choose from between me and my boyfriend, John. He's a great photographer, too. Only he always throws away the bad ones before I can get my hands on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're a strange bunch when we're teaching. Eh? We want the bad ones to show an example of something. Keep the bad one. Keep the bad one. <laughs> I know. What do you do, Rich? Are you always shooting? or Where do you get your photos that you use? Um, I shoot all mine. It depends. Uh, I have a mixture of some things that are for client jobs, and then I have others that I use um, where I specifically go on trips. So I'll usually take two to three trips a year. Uh, I've got a time-lapse workshop coming up that I'm teaching in the fall uh, in Valley of Fire. Um, I took cool. a, a trip this spring to um, Milan and shot out there for a week. So usually I can designate a few weeks of travel just to go out and acquire photos to use for all the different tutorials and things that I do. And then because of my job and client work, I frequently have to travel around the world. So while I'm there, I'll usually tack on a day to shoot. So... I try very hard to um, let the people, I don't want to say live vicariously, but to not just look at the same things that they always see. So I try extra hard to always freshen my image pool so I can bring up stuff from around the world. Like last year I went to Tokyo and that produced a lot of great images. Wow. Yeah, I know. I, I always see when you do that because I get to see some of them on Facebook and on Google Plus and all those good places. And I saw you were in Milan. You know, I was in Milan almost the same time you were this year. It was beautiful. <laughs> so, it, and nobody told me. I thought Milan was just going to be the place to get the airplane home. Not. No. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful cathedrals. Wow. Yeah. So What's that one, you know, the big one? The Duomo, is it? Duomo. Yep. Yeah, I just did a Linda class, actually, where uh, on Pixelmator, the competitor to Photoshop, but I use my Milan images because... Uh, I always like to know what other tools are doing, and I found some things in there that I really liked. So um, I used a lot of my images from from that trip in that class. So I always try to freshen it uh, and just have different images. It's it's fun, and uh, you know, as a child, I didn't get to do a lot of travel, so I, I'm overcompensating now as I get older. Yeah, but you can't carry all those suitcases anymore. Uh, not right now, I can't. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes. Oh my gosh. Well, are you feeling okay enough to show us some of your wonderfulness? Absolutely. So, um, I'll uh, we'll just do sort of. Let me, I guess, share my screen. Is that what you want me to do? Share the desktop. Yeah. All right. So let me. It's going to mirror for just a second here. So let me start the screen share. And are you seeing Bridge? Yes. 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 Yeah. See it good. good. All fresh. right. Everything good coming through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so uh, we'll just play this. I'll make these a little bit bigger, and uh, we'll just play pick an image. I'm wide open here. I've got lots of different stuff. I'll I'll throw one out to begin, but uh, either pick an image or a folder. You go ahead, Ron. Oh, things are going by so quickly. Um, let's say, uh, what's in your depth of field folder? Okay, so this is focus stacking, which oh, is an easy it. thing to do. And uh, a lot of times when you take a picture, you can't get the whole image in focus. And so uh, 
you know, you see in this case that different parts of the image are in focus with the three stacks. And so this is a real common problem. In this case, I really only need the two images to pull this off. And all I did was, this is just down in Costa Rica, um, I was using uh, Olympus OMD, and I could just tap the screen to focus and take the picture. So I touched on the foreground flower, and then I touched on the background flower, and they're both in focus. And Photoshop makes it really easy to combine those into one image. So you could in Bridge, choose Tools, Photoshop, and then basically you're going to load those into a stack. Um, and you got a couple of ways. So I could choose, um, let me remember here, I believe Photo Merge is going to do it, but if not, let's see what it wants to do. So we'll come on over here. Uh, what I, no, let me do it this way. Um, file scripts, and I'll just stack those, and, oh, please tell me they didn't get rid of this in the new version. Jan, no, help me. It said load files into stack, down, there down. There we go. There we go. Perfect. So I just got to point it at those two files, and what it's going to do is Photoshop will sort of intelligently mask those images and load just the two and remove the blurry parts and keep the in-focus parts. So... Uh, let me just make sure I'm in the right folder. That'll take just one split second. There we go. I've got everything in a folder for tonight. And that was the depth of field. And so we'll just grab those two and say open. And there they are. And I'll click OK. And they get loaded into one document. And Photoshop will attempt to automatically align them. And it basically opens both images and then copies one into the other and then it will go through and remove the content. So here we go. We've got the two images, and I just want to... Um, oh, this is going to be fun all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love it when they Photoshop updates and hides the new features on me. So, Ron, you had to pick the one that was going to be hard to start mm -hmm. with. Well, Ron knows how to do this, right, Ron? Yeah. Tell me, Ron. You're, you're muted, Ron. Yeah, it just told me I was muted. Hey, yeah, I do this an awful lot. I just finished actually a three-part series for my, uh, for some Arcanum stuff on focus stacking. So it's I right didn't know here, about right? that from Bridge, by the way. I go into Tools and load as layers in Photoshop, but yeah, under the under the uh, under the uh, file, it's you just had it there: auto align layers and then auto blend layers. Yeah. So there we go. That's right. So I use that. So it's going to be layer and uh, align, right? Yeah. Nope, not that one. Where is it? Image? Yeah. It's in... should be in edit. Or there we go. There we go. Uh, You're right. Yeah. Auto, auto blend layers. That's right. So auto, auto align is going to first take them and make sure they're lined up. So I'll just click OK, and it analyzes the two images and makes sure that as you click between them there, that any shifting that might have happened by bumping the cameras taken care of. And then the auto blend layers is just going to basically choose stack images and it will go through and mask out the blurry parts giving you a greater depth of field than you could achieve with a single lens. So there, both flowers are perfectly in focus on that close-up shot and you could sort of see there how it masked out the different details to combine the two images. Hey, how about that? A team tutorial. Oxycontin <laughs> doesn't win. <laughs> and, and, you know, one of the great features, yeah, one of the great features about doing this is you don't have to crank your camera now up to, like, F22 and get a completely sharp background. Right. Uh, you're able to still maintain a fairly soft background, so it, it gives you a, an extra uh, feature when you do this. And you don't have to bump up the ISO because you're shooting at such a small aperture either. So it's, yeah. a, it's kind of a cool thing. I, I like it. So thank you for the team thing. Let's... Uh, <laughs> Let's move next to it. Do this easy one. Oh, wait, um, I got a question. Can you sure? Can you, can you shoot those guys uh, with a tripod or just handheld? This was uh, on a tripod, but I've done this handheld. The auto align feature is forgiving enough that it can usually take care of any minor shakes. Great. So um, here's a command that most people don't use. I suspect you do, Jan. But the uh, equalize command. Do you use it at all? She's not. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I can't see her because I'm on the She's screen. So. Okay. So this is one of those commands that on its own looks ugly. Like you choose it and it's just brutal. It like slams the image into place 
And what it's attempting to do is sort of like boost the color and the brightness and everything else. But what I find is, is after you run it, you just immediately choose Edit Fade, and you back it off about halfway, and you've got a nice looking image for like any time you're dealing with, uh, you know, an image that was sort of shot under harsh lighting. It's almost like an instant fix. It's a destructive fix, so you might want to duplicate the layer or work with a copy and it's not available as an adjustment layer but it's just one of those things that's an easy quick fix that I'll often try when I'm dealing with really washed out colors so if we bring up that history panel one of the things I love is if we just make a snapshot here how easy it is to toggle between the two states to see the before and after and that's wow. kind of a fast easy way to pull that off I learned something. Yeah. That's great. That's right. great. Never used that before, but I'll certainly be checking it out. It's just a, it's a quick, easy one. So um, I, I like it. It's, it just makes it kind of simpler to, to pull off some easy results. All right. Um, how about down here? Anything catch your eye? Dave's it's turn to pick. <laughs> <laughs> I need to click on his. I want to uh, see the pigs. Yeah, okay. Okay. we're going with the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> That's always fun. So one of the things that a lot of folks don't realize is that Photoshop has a bunch of built-in cool textures. And I want to show you the ones in Photoshop, but before I do that, have you guys seen the uh, cool new thing inside of Creative Cloud under Assets? Yes. So uh, you got this whole marketplace now, and all this stuff is free. So you could just search for things, and there's all sorts of different things like patterns, and that's going to bring up all sorts of stuff. Or you could just type in something like search for grunge, and it's going to go through and pull up all these great textures that you can use as overlays on images if you want to sort of uh, mess things up a little bit. So, for example, let's just grab this fabric texture, and I'll click Download, and it's going to pull that into my Creative Cloud folder. Now, while that's pulling down, I'll also point out that under your pop-up menu here, you do have patterns. And by default, these kind of suck because the default ones that are loaded, let's just reset this here for a moment, is you probably thought that this was one of the most useless features in Photoshop because these are like right out of the early 80s screensaver textures. Like, you remember when that was your Mac desktop pattern? I mean, these are the defaults. I don't even know why they bothered promoting this to 16-bit. It's like that was like, <laughs> ooh, look, it's bubbles. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> useless. But like all good things Adobe, you have to first know where to click to choose it. Then you have to know that you can click and click again to access a list. And now all of a sudden it's useful. So I can get into things like artist surfaces and there's a whole bunch of cool textures in here let's just make this a little bit bigger so you can see it and you know there's this burlap texture or sort of this soft rock texture here uh, all these great things that are one click away and so that makes it really easy to lay that texture on top and you could do a couple of things with it one thing I'll sometimes do is if I really want to distress an image I'll go over here into the channels palette and I'll just command click to load that as a selection. Now you might not see the selection but if you add that as a layer mask it actually kind of distresses the image and it's pretty easy now to just lay that over the texture and if I zoom in there a little bit you could sort of see how it looks like it's actually printed on that texture because we've sort of masked part of the image and the texture shows through based on the bumps or you could put the texture right on top and play with your blending modes. Things like a multiply is a nice way to lay that on top or an overlay. And you could start to make these textures look like they're mixed in with the photo or that the photo was printed on a type of paper rather than actually having to print it out and rescan it. Oh, that's a good idea. Well, you know, it reminds me too, have you seen that Russell Brown has some kind of a panel mm -hmm. with uh, textures, yep. paper textures? Yep, and those are pulling actually out of that same CC Marketplace type stuff too. So yeah, that's it's awesome stuff and you can use those. There's just so many great ways. So if I go into my Creative Cloud folder, there's the market download and there's that light fabric texture that I just pulled down. 
And so it's right. simple enough to drag that onto Photoshop. It's going to come in as a small thing. Now, this one was vector, so it may want to go through Illustrator first. So let's see if we can force that to open. Sometimes they have them as SVG files, which are going to be vector files, but Photoshop mm -hmm. should be able to think around that. Let's see. Nope, being cranky. Oh, well. But that's always fun. And uh, you could run that through Illustrator first or, or place it in there. But that works out kind of cool. And there's so many of those texture layers. If you double-click on a texture, you can also adjust it. So if you decide while working with that texture, oh, I want to change that. Click the pop-up list, change it. Oh, make it bigger. Or reposition it. Just drag in the window. It's really easy to really refine that texture and then use that with the surface. And I'll just zoom in since this is being sort of compressed. But you can see how it looks like the photo and the texture have been merged together, which is kind of a fun way just to simulate some of those textures in the surfaces. Yeah. Now, if you go out and shoot your own textures, where, where would you drop them so they show up in the list? Well, there's a couple ways of doing it. Um, I should have some textures on here. Funny you should ask. Let's see here. Uh, we'll do a search for the word texture, and hopefully something will pan out. There this we go. It's always dangerous, you know. Yes, it's always interesting. <laughs> Good. This is a safe one. Here's a texture <laughs> I shot, which is just a <laughs> So, good, because you don't always know when you randomly open files on your computer, you know, bad things can happen, but uh, that was safe. So, <laughs> we'll open that up, and this isn't a seamless pattern right now. Um, if you just want to define something as is, and it's not seamless, you just select it and say, edit, define pattern, and it adds it. So, we can call that orange rough. If you want to make it seamless, there's a little trick. You take this and you say filter, other, which is the category nobody ever visits because it's crappily named, and you choose offset. And you basically push this a little bit to the right and a little bit down so you can see the seams. And now you just basically need to use things like the clone stamp tool, try content or wear fill, but you basically just need to sort of blend these together using your cloning until you can get a nice edge. And sometimes you could do that pretty simply. You see there, like that, just a little bit of cloning and lowering the opacity, a few strokes, you can get in there. And once that's done, and you feel that you've got a sort of a seamless pattern, then it's even easier to say, edit, define pattern, and reuse it. So let's just finish that out. That's going to be close. Edit. Define pattern. There we go. And we'll call that orange rough 2. And now, back over here, if I load that pattern, you'll see it's right there and available. Wow. And it can be scaled. And you can use your own textures and repositioned. And so that's not a perfect seamless pattern, but it's sure not bad, and I could certainly use that. Yeah. You know what we used to do with, I forgot about this feature because it's been so long, when I taught at lynda.com's live classroom, so when was that? A Nine, long time ago. <laughs> year 2000, uh, 2001, we, uh, we were teaching web design and we used this feature to create, um, you know, like these patterned backgrounds, so you'd have like this giant JPEG or something, you know, that you created using this offset filter, and then you'd yep. shove that in as your, as your web page background. Yep, absolutely, and that's peak. So it works as a seamless way to, to make your own patterns. Now, I'm going to pick one here. This is just a fun, simple technique. People like spot colors, where one color comes through. Here's my favorite way of doing it. If you just pick the black and white adjustment layer, first off, a lot of people don't know that you got this great tool here, the on image tool, which allows you to click, and it intelligently grabs the correct area and allows you to mix to do your own custom black and white conversion. So thereby manipulating the yellow and green independently, I get a nice black and white. But if I set that mode to lighten, well, now it gets really easy. Let's just reset this tool really quick. And now if I drag to the left here, the color gets darker. And if I drag to the right, the color gets lighter. And so it's quite simple to go in 
and pull out all of one color. So if I wanted to pull out that red and just leave the greens behind, I'll just take that over. And so it's very simple to isolate on an individual color using that by just putting the layer into lighten mode. And the flip of that is putting it into darken mode. And it works sort of the same way. To the left gets darker. To the right leaves the color. And you see how fast and easy that is to just dial in a spot color effect. That's cool, but honest to God, this, you know, here's a good example of the, the little issue I have with Photoshop, which is how would a normal human being know that? You know, you have to go on <laughs> a research project or know somebody or just happened upon, you know, a great tutorial by Rich Harrington. Um, you know what I mean? And, and it's at some point it just becomes all secret, and I don't see the value of that really. Well, what I would say is this. Most people get confused by blending modes. And they don't have to be confusing. So here's a simple example. You toss on a black and white effect, like a black and white adjustment, and you just click Auto. Well, now that you've got that, you've got all these blending modes. And they're organized. These make them darker. These make them lighter. These mix them based on light. And then these are rarely useful. And so if you just <laughs> select that layer, you could press Shift Plus to step through your blending modes. And now that black and white layer in Multiply becomes like a cool dark grid effect. And as you step through, it can be useful to create just different types of black and white or distressed black and white type treatments. And it's just a fast, easy way to use that. So and it can be any adjustment layer, right? It doesn't have to be. Any adjustment layer. So like color lookups are some of my favorites. I could toss on a nice uh, fall colors look and then just shift plus to step through blending modes and look at that in multiply mode. Those fall colors just pop the browns and bring out the age of that skull. So I find that a lot of times adjustment layers on their own, not that interesting. But as soon as you toss a blending mode in with that adjustment layer, it's really nice. And so there's that lookup table just using the fall color preset or how about the horror blue, you know? Now, all of a sudden, it takes on that sort of gritty, scientific, you know, horror film look of the mad scientist laboratory. Toss that into soft light, and it just takes on sort of a gentle bluish cast. So it's a fast, easy way, and this is really where the secret lies, is in those blending modes. And so I often just find myself experimenting. And for that matter, let's say you run a filter. Uh, we'll take something simple here, like the uh, gallery effects which have some tremendously ugly filters in them. But I'll run the filter gallery. And you know, let's just try something like glowing edges, which you would probably never, ever use. I can't even remember where it's hidden here. It's probably down under stylized. There we go, glowing edges. And on its own, it looks horrendous. But immediately after running the filter, I could just say, edit, fade, oh yeah. I remember, screen drops out the black. Now it takes on sort of an illustration look. And because I know you prefer non-destructive workflows, just make that a smart object first. And you could run that same filter again. There it is. Click OK. And this little arrow here is the fade command. If you double click on that arrow for a smart filter, you can access the fade command. So go to screen mode and knock that down to about 60%. And we have an instant illustration look where it takes something and simplifies some of the details and turns it into more of a drawing. That's great. Blend modes are very powerful. I was going to ask you, you know Scott Valentine, right? Mm-hmm. It's a great book. It? He wrote a yeah. whole book on it. It's very good stuff. Yeah, I love it. I think it's called, I don't remember the name, I wish I did, something like Blend Modes in Photoshop, and I thought that was great, and I really appreciate that somebody's now publishing these detailed deep dives into specific features. I think uh, that's really neat. So you guys want to do, it's a great book, absolutely. Do you guys want to do, open a video file in Photoshop? Do you want to do some camera raw stuff? What would you like to do? Well, if you want to do camera raw, you're going to hear me kvetching. <laughs> I, I saw a cinema I just, there. Yeah, I just yeah. did a whole six hour workshop on camera raw and I was like oh you know I'm so used to Lightroom now and I was just getting madder and madder and how everything was so clunky <laughs> okay well, so what would you like 
I saw the cinemagraph. Uh, we could do. Let's save cinemagraphs for the end because those are okay. a little hard. So you tell me when we're in like the last ten minutes, and I'll pull up the cinemagraph. Um, how about uh, we'll do something simple here? How about we do the best of both? We'll use camera raw as a filter, and I'll open up a video file to do it. So we'll get a little bit of everything here. So uh, let's go here, and I'm just going to open up a movie file. Let me see which one I got here. Here we go. And this is just uh, a shot from a music video. And a lot of people don't realize that you can open up videos into Photoshop CC or if you've got CS6 you'll need the extended version. Um, but this is a video file and so it looks like a still photo but if I drag through, sure enough, it's a clip from a music video. Now what I like is that uh, normally video files come out somewhat soft out of a DSLR because of the compression. It's got to smash down and throw away a lot of data in order to write it to the card fast enough. I mean, essentially think of it this way. It's writing 30 still images a second to that memory card for several seconds over time while also recording audio. So if you think about that, that's kind of hard for the camera to do. So a lot of data is thrown away. But if we make that a smart object, convert for smart filters, now you can use Camera Raw as a filter. And this is also available if you have a JPEG or anything else. Now, you can't take advantage of like great recovery. Like a RAW file or a video file, you can't recover the highlights like a, like a you know, uh, sorry, JPEG or a video file won't recover highlights like a RAW file. But there's a lot we can do. So, uh, Jan, you were saying you like to start on some tabs first. Which tab's your first preference one? Well, I would start with basic tab usually. All right. So we can go in and assign a white balance manually, or I can take the eyedropper and find a reference point in the image to tweak the white balance, which works well. Um, so, you know, obviously, I just threw it off there by clicking on the skin tone. But I can dial in a white balance until I'm happy with it. That feels pretty good. Uh, one of the things I also like is with exposure. Now, if you hold on the Option key on a lot of these sliders as you drag, the white areas are areas that are clipping. So I could recover this shot so that those aren't clipping. Now, instead of doing that with exposure, I'm going to do that with highlights and recover the blown out highlights. And I'll bring that exposure adjustment back up a little bit. But that's an easy way to check for clipping areas within the image, is just that option drag. Let's lift the shadows a little bit as well. And if you go too far, you'll see if those are clipping. But that's a nice, easy way to sort of get the exposure right on the overall image. And then, because this is a, a music video with a gritty texture, normally I wouldn't push clarity too far. But for this particular look, I like the furrowed brow and the hair and the this old caboose he's sitting at. So I find that clarity comes out nicely. Of course, we do have these nice before and after here where you can sort of work and see them side by side. Or, you know, you can go in there and see this as uh, more of a sort of a split screen. So I could just say, show me this split screen as I'm working on the side here, side by side or go right here with a split showing me the before and after. And I kind of like that. It just makes it a little bit easier as you're working to sort of see what's happening in the image. Now, let's just go to that side by side there. And this should really help. The top is the original image. The bottom's the new one. I'll bring out the vibrance for the overall saturation for the skin tones, but reduce the global saturation just a bit. So far, so good? Yep. Yeah, I was going to mention, by the way, that those preview buttons at the bottom, those are new in Camera Raw 8.5, which mm -hmm. is the latest and greatest one. And um, I think that you can't get that if you have Photoshop CS6. Am I right? You get Camera Raw 8.5, but it doesn't have the new features. I'm not sure if that one made it in or not. I think they just added the support for new cameras for CS6, but not new features. That would sound about right. No. So, so that's cool. this is... Uh, since this is cam uh, Camera Raw using the same engine that Lightroom uses, are, is there, are there similar things we could do if they're using Lightroom? You can, but not to a video file. Okay. So video files in Lightroom, you can only use the quick develop presets, while in Photoshop, you can use the full Camera Raw engine, 
don't get me started. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, I thought that even was camera raw. <laughs> can I, I want to be sure I understand. It's because you're using camera raw as a filter, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So okay. if I'm, and then of course we can deal with a typical curve, and so we can lift up that there and bring up the midtones just a little, and we're getting a nice look. I really like the sharpening though here. And again, holding down the option slider, you could see the radius. So is that coming through in the webcast? Can you guys see yes. the edges? Yes, so I love right. this. This makes it really easy to say, well, what areas am I affecting? And how much detail are we putting in? Let's adjust the mask there so the certain areas are being ignored. Like the black areas there are not getting affected, so I'm not bringing out a bunch of noise. And so this way, I could really sharpen the hair but the large flat areas, as you see in that mask, were being ignored. So the hair is being affected and the edges are being affected, but most of those flat surfaces are not. And so that little option or alt drag of the sliders goes a long way to really see what you're fixing. So here's the thing there, Rich. You can only see it on this one frame of the video until yep. you get out of here, right? Yeah, when I click out of here, I could, then I could see everything, but yeah. And, and then, of course, you've got the ability to do graduated filters. So if I want to pull this area down a little bit, we'll just leave that temperature and tint alone. Double-click on a slider to reset it. But I can pull the exposure down a little bit and take the clarity down so that area sort of falls off. And let's just remove the color. There we go. That's working pretty well. We'll just reset that back to white. And so you can knock down areas of the shot if you want to sort of pull things down a little bit. So by pulling down that exposure and the contrast, I could sort of defocus the de-emphasize that area a little bit for some fall off. And then of course, as you continue to work through, the ability to split tone. So put a little bit of saturation into the highlights, in this case, warming them up a bit. I like that. And then for the shadows, cool them down. And then, of course, removing chromatic aberration for high contrast areas is nice. You do have upright, believe it or not, on video, which can be really useful yeah. if you want to fix things in the background that are not straight. Like I just straightened all those poles right there, if you notice that. Yeah. Before, after. So all of a sudden now everything's nice and perpendicular. And then, of course, you could put a little bit of a post-crop vignette on that to pull down the edges and to guide the eye. And it works pretty well. And what I really like is that as I'm working here, I could just make a snapshot. And so I could store all of those settings. And now it's a piece of cake. So as I create different looks, I could just click through those looks and grab them in a single click and reuse those on different productions and switch between them. And that's all stored as a preset so that if I'm working on a project that has several video clips, I don't have to start over with each shot. Or same thing with several photos. That's really cool. All right, now I, I'm going to bust into your demo a minute because I want people to see something yeah. really nice yeah. that's in Camera Raw that's not in Lightroom. Could you click on the... Um, uh, the graduated filter tool for just a moment again. Sure. Okay. And you see, uh, select your graduated filter that you made. Yep. Uh, yeah. Now go over where it says under graduated filter, click where it says brush. And that's the filter brush. Oh, you know yeah. about that? Uh, you can now add and subtract to this, right? Yes. So you can uh, paint away or, or, sub or remove mm. part of that graduated filter. Oh. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so there we're rounding it out a little bit around the edges there. That's kind of nice. <laughs> so like we'll, if, you had a, if you had a landscape with the Eiffel Tower and you wanted to fix the sky but not the Eiffel Tower, you could get your linear gradient and then you could just erase away the Eiffel Tower. Isn't yeah, so what I did there is I sort of like brought his hair back in while pushing the background behind him down. Brilliant. That's well done, cool. Jen. Yeah. And uh, I click OK, and there's the original, and there's the new video. And I think that's a pretty good fix 
for a pretty quick fix, you know, and then you would just render that file back out. And so, you know, file export video. But of course, you could do the same thing to any image, even if it was a TIFF or a JPEG or you couldn't find the raw file, you could still take advantage of camera raw to do quite a bit. Yeah, so now, would you really oh sorry. <laughs> It's okay, I was just going to ask regarding that, if you didn't want to affect the entire clip, could you split that clip into pieces and then apply a camera raw filter to each piece? Yeah, just uh, you just simply take your scissors, and so if I want to do uh, the front part of the shot, I could split that and then come a little later and split it, and you know, it's simply another yeah. instance of the filter. Double-click, and you can modify it. Great. Oh, that's, that's awesome. So it actually is pretty powerful it, right inside Photoshop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a very useful tool for fixing things. And to that end, besides just stylizing images, let's say you needed to um, remove some distortion from an image. So let's do, I've got a really good example of this. Uh, here we go, wide angle distortion. So Photoshop's got a couple of different ways to remove wide angle distortion. And so I'm going to show you um, a few of those. And so here's one. And a very common problem is like you shot on a camera that's wide angle. In this case, this is a shot from a GoPro. But if you convert for smart filters, you can then run lens correction as a filter. And you could just choose the type of camera. And you'll see now that they've got profiles, not just for pro cameras, but also for things like iPhones and the DJI Phantom if you're using a helicopter camera or GoPros for action sports. And then you just choose the appropriate preset for that. And once you've done that, if it's too much, because in this case it's a little bit over the top, uh, you could just go in and refine the amount of that distortion until you have a straight horizon. And so you can pull that out pretty easily. And so that's a fast, easy thing to do. Um, what I really like, though, is using the adaptive wide angle tool, which most people don't know how to use. This, I do a lot of uh, landscape photography and panoramic photography. So this is good for anybody if you're doing panoramas or wide angle photos. You just basically draw straight lines. So it'll automatically detect, oh, this was a fisheye. It tries to fix it for you, or you can run it on auto, but in this case, it, it fixed it, but it's not perfect. If you just draw what you think is supposed to be a straight line, and you could pull that in so it lines up, it's going to go through and make that a straight line. So I could say, oh, this should be straight. And then if it's not straight, you just rotate this a little bit, and you could fix any curved lines that you have. Like, see how that tower has got a curved line? Now it's straight. Oh, I want to fit. And this green indicates that Photoshop is telling you, oh, yeah, that looks correct. Once it goes green, that's Photoshop's way of giving you feedback that it believes the line is at the correct angle. So I can draw here for the horizon and simply rotate that just a little. And now I've got a straight horizon scale up just slightly to get beyond those gaps, click OK, and all of my wide-angle distortion and crooked shot was fixed. Can I ask you a question, something I don't know, I'm really, I hope you know, mm -hmm. um, if you don't, it's cool, but uh, does it have to recognize your lens and camera in order, in order to do that? And the reason I ask is because I have, I'm shooting with the OMD EM5 a lot, which has, you know, usually um, that's outside of that universe. Well, well, yeah. no, so it's, it's, here's, the, here's the thing, because I, I busted their chops because I was unhappy that supposedly uh, it wasn't, and here's what I found out. With, uh, I'm, I'm looking for another wide-angle photo to show you real quick, but okay. it actually isn't. The difference is, is with those micro four-thirds, it is automatically doing the correction because all of those things are embedded in the file, and it's actually handling it better than your DSLRs, it's automatically doing the wide-angle correction. That's why it's not even giving you a choice. It's already been fixed when you open the image. Right, I do know that, and it tells you that in Camera Raw now, uh, yes. the latest version of Camera Raw. But my question was, so what happens when you take that kind of a deal where the fix is already in the raw mm -hmm. file and try to do wide-angle, adaptive wide-angle filter? I wonder if it can do it because it can't, you know what I'm saying? It, it doesn't still work. Yeah, it could, it could still work. Uh, so it can override what's there, 
um, here's something shot on a DSLR, and so let's just do, this is just a still use of that same filter. So if I do the adaptive wide angle, uh, this is one of those shots where many people would have used upright, but I actually prefer to do this manually. So I can draw a line here, and if I shift click on that line, it's going to force it to be horizontal, or in this case vertical, I should say. And now I can just turn that until it goes green. Draw another one right here. This looks like it should be straight. And shift click again. And then just rotate that until it goes green. And there is even this tool here for drawing a polygon. So if you have something like a sign, you can go around it and force that to detect. And now same thing, you can shift click on each one of those sides to force that to go to uh, perpendicular and vertical. And so it's really kind of cool how flexible this is. And then like, let's go along the bottom of it here and simply rotate that slightly. And you see how I've squared up the action? Does that make but it sense? does have something to do, Rich, with, see at the bottom left where it says your camera model and lens model? The yeah. way that those lines, uh, you know, um, glue themselves to the actual uh, content of the image has to do with it recognizing your camera and lens, I think. It, it works with, I use it with four, Micro Four Thirds. I don't have a wide-angle image from one of my Micro Four Thirds cameras, but I shoot on both OMD and GH4 all the time. It totally works. Cool. And right here, you can see where it's sort of falling apart. So it's not a bad idea to sometimes add a few extra lines if you have them so that, like, you know, the image is starting to bend at the edges there, so it's straightened out that. And the, the color feedback is what I like. Like, you know, you could see when you've got a green line if it's working or not working. And, you know, just by adding a few extra lines there, you can really shape things up. So, you know, that got rid of quite a bit of distortion. Yeah. Fill that in and call it good. And then, of course, once that's done, um, I ran this as a smart filter. So I can't use content-aware fill on this, but if I just duplicate this layer and rasterize it to get rid of uh, the that one being a smart object, now it's really simple. Command-click to load a selection. Select inverse to choose the outside pixels. And then I'll just grow that a little bit. Uh, we'll expand that by, say, 10 pixels. And now you could just say Edit Fill Content Aware and let it rip. And it may not be perfect. Like, I don't think it's going to handle this right edge very well. But I'll usually just take that version and toss it down below. And now when I go to recrop, I don't have to crop as tightly. Like, everything down mm -hmm. here was fine. And I can just, let me clear that out, by the way. I can just crop out the parts of the image I want, but I didn't have to crop as tightly because the content-aware fill gave me more pixels to work with. And you see there how it filled that in pretty easily. Love that. Uh, that's that's funny. That's a, yeah, I mean, literally, I had, had three conversations in the last 12 hours that covered everything you just covered. <laughs> OK. We had discussions about, oh, I can't use my content-aware film on a, on a, because you have to rasterize it. And that's something yeah. people don't recognize. Because Dave Cross was on last show. Um, Drilling it into our heads to use uh, our smart objects. Yeah. And but there are times when you just can't do that. So that was a great, great explanation of how we can duplicate that and then rasterize it and still make use of uh, as much non-destructive editing as we can. Oh yeah. I mean, there, it's always fine to do a save a copy or or work on something like that. I mean, there's there's so many ways of doing it. Um, it's just fun. So how about a panel with wide angle? Can we run one of that? And this will take a second to merge. But oh, let's do that because that was the other conversation I had okay. this morning. <laughs> Okay, so you know that people are starting to get it. I mean, in a way, it's like you say, "Oh, well, people already know everything," but they don't. But they're starting to get it, and it took years and years and years, and a lot of teaching and a lot of different people teaching. Yeah, so, so one of the questions I had this yeah. morning while you're loading that is well, let, let me let me start the running of this, and then we could talk it through because sure. it'll take five minutes to merge. So tools. So this is just an image. Um, and you could see between each of them that there's a little bit of overlap. I go for like 30% usually is what I find to be a good number, but it's up to you. If you're dealing with raw files 
and you want to um, develop them first before you run photo merge, simply uh, you know open those images into Camera Raw. Just select everything, right click and say Open in Camera Raw. You can do any development that you want. You know, so I'll recover those highlights, lift the shadows, a little bit of clarity since there's a lot of texture, pop the vibrance. Let's say I'm happy with that, and then select all and synchronize so that it applies the same adjustments to everything. Now, when I run Photo Merge, it's going to use those new adjustment settings on it. And even if you didn't have raw files, you could still do that open in camera raw to develop the files before you do the photo merge. So but you, you wouldn't do any distortion adjustments at all with that before you ran your... It depends. Sometimes I will run the camera profile. So if I'm here, you I wouldn't do anything like upright necessarily, yeah. but if you wanted to, if you did want to run upright, uh, what you need to do that's very important is after you run it, you have to click sync results across all of the images to sync the upright setting. And this sync is different than this sync over here. It's really dumb that you have two different syncs, but upright has its own sync results button to synchronize for multiple images. And I have to use I that when I do a time lapse. I learned a second new thing. That's great. There we go. Is, I call that more of a bug than a feature. Yeah. <laughs> so. Great. Um, but I think they're fixing that as they go forward. So you could use upright. You could apply lens profile adjustments if you wanted. You know, in this case, it did recognize it. So you know, you could take advantage of that. And if you want to remove chromatic aberration for high contrast areas, all of that is good stuff to do. Uh, particularly because with panos, a lot of times on contrast areas, you may see a little bit of fringe. It's hard to see at this resolution, but let's just pretend there was. So um, now if I just say Tools, Photoshop, Photo Merge, it'll go to town and start to merge all of those. There's everything great. Blend the images together. I've already done the distortion correction, but Photo Merge has its own if you want. When you click OK, it's going to open all of those up and combine them into one document. Now that's going to take a second to run, so fire away with anything else that you guys want to talk about or give people some tips, because you said you had a story to tell, Ron. I'm sorry to interrupt. Well, no, that's fine, because you, you've you actually answered most of the questions while you're doing this. We have someone in the uh, in the comments watching the show, and, and I just know they're going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I needed to know this morning. So. <laughs> They've even time-stamped it. I have to start watching this at 47 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to tell you something, which is I know exactly. This is Jerusalem, isn't it? Uh, yeah, this is the, the wall. So, yeah, I, the, this is Jerusalem, and uh, this is beautiful, and this is one of those great trips I got to go on. I was a, a guest of, uh, uh, to this country of Israel and uh, got to do some speaking there a couple of years ago, and uh, I got to see some of the cultural sites, including if you dig hard enough around on Facebook, you'll see a picture of me covered in the mud of the of the uh, black uh, the black mud of the uh, oh I'm the Dead Sea. Dead Sea, the Dead Sea. Yes, amazing stuff. <laughs> so, do, you know that I used to live there. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. I miss it. I do have a question about the panorama for for yeah. any of you who might know. I you know Google has their format for the the photospheres where you can you know pan around inside it. Uh, yep. Um, is, is there a simple way to convert what you end up with here into that format? Uh, I haven't played with, with that one. I imagine they want a spherical one, and Photoshop only does cylindrical. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to use other tools, uh, usually to do a true spherical. Photoshop can only do cylindrical panoramas. Yeah. But there are some third-party tools. Well, that's loading. I, I just want to go back and just just in my mind confirm because I've only ever used the done panels using raw files and using the 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 lens uh, the adaptive wide angle mm -hmm. to do corrections in I've only ever done that to raw files so if you have tiffs or jpegs it's not going to pull a camera profile but it's still possible to do it absolutely uh, yeah yeah so this is this is going to take a little while as it's aligning but we can go back to bridge and do a few things in there in the meantime here's a fun little thing so like you think you're locked out of photoshop right like because photoshop's busy right now here's yeah. what i love if i go to cam if i go to bridge i could say open in camera raw 
and I can keep working while Photoshop's running in the background. I'm not locked out here. I can just go on to another task. So it's kind of fun that, like, while Photoshop's processing that panorama, I can go process some more images. So that's one of the great things about knowing about Bridge and Camera Raw. You could basically be doing double image processing. You know, you don't have to stop. So, um, so let's just adjust this one. And uh, I could pop the clarity here a little bit. And what I wanted to talk about on this particular one is using uh, the vignette here that we actually have a radial brush now. So, Jan, I'm sure you love the radial filter. This allows you to do all sorts of things. And I usually find myself, as I play with this here, you'll notice that there's a couple settings. Like I could say affect the inside or affect the outside. And so the ability to really dial in things like exposure, I like to do some negative clarity to simplify those edges as well as desaturate the edges a little bit to pull your eye in towards the center. And this gives you some flexible control there so that you could really dial in uh, much more different than you would with a typical vignette. And so you can get in there and really push that. It is really cool, but I, I want to show you the one thing that bugs me about these tools. Yeah. There is no done button here. And the way that to get out of this is really odd. It's nothing I think would that somebody would figure out. You know what it is, of course. You have to switch to another tool. <laughs> yeah. But like why yeah. would you ever think that? And I was teaching a class and people were saying that, you know, I I had them guess what it was and they couldn't guess that. Yeah. No, I agree with you. That's uh, there's there's room for discoverability there, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and while you're developing these images, I do like though clicking on these two buttons up here, these two triangles, because this will show you clipping indicators. So in this case, if I were to print this image, these areas that are blue would be totally black. So holding down that option key as I drag, I could see that I'm recovering some of those, and that just is useful. So in this case, I could lift those blacks just slightly with the black slider so that I would actually get a little bit of better ink coverage. Same thing there for the highlights. You could see as you drag, if you play with the highlights and start to push things too far, you'll see that they start to show clipping indicators. And that makes it really easy, again, as you drag, like those red pixels are showing clipping in the red channel. So it's kind of a nice way to really tell if you're getting any image clipping as you're working. Um, let's see how Photoshop's doing. Almost there. Um, here, clipping right on that head. This is, a, this is the weirdest thing. This beetle that's pure silver is a real beetle. It actually has metallics. You could see the photographer, me in this case, reflected in it. It's a very twisted nature photographer selfie. So there's me taking a picture of this beetle. <laughs> but if I recover those whites you could see that they start to recover there. And same thing, recover the highlights just a little bit. A certain amount of clipping is okay, but if I'm concerned, that just makes it easy to know how far you have to go until the clipping's taken care of. And so I like holding down that option key. Uh, in this case, let's take advantage of using the adjustment brush. And what I like is taking the option down here to auto mask and I'll show the mask. So now as I paint, it's very quick and easy to paint this image and it starts to get the edges. Now, I will typically recommend that you adjust the brush, right bracket, bigger brush, shift, left bracket, harder brush, and you get that visual feedback. So it's very easy to see what's being affected. Oh, my startup disk is almost full. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. that's because I got a big image open. Those yeah, are all raw files. <laughs> but uh, there we go. So you see there how it quickly picks up the edges on that object. And uh, you can really get in there and not have to paint quite so carefully. If you get too much, it's just an option to subtract. And now I can do things like separately adjust that area. So if I want to crank up the sharpness a little bit and boost the clarity on just that bug, it's really easy to push the details. And you see there how the metallic texture is coming through. We'll pop the contrast a little bit there. And I like that. So you can just see there. And we can roll the tint a little. And so it's very fast and easy. Let's just put that side by side. 
and you could see how I was able to bring out some of the details on the bug. And so that's just a simple, cool thing. I like the adjustment brush for that. I have All a right. question. I have a question. Yep. I yep. think that I'm right about this, but you know this better than I. Um, I couldn't find any way to set all those sliders back to zero when I started with a new adjustment brush. The best I could do was click one of those little preset buttons, and mm -hmm. that would set everything to zero except for the one that I clicked. Is that right? You can choose. Uh, what I would recommend is out of this flyout here. It doesn't work unless you've already started your mask. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. That's dumb. <laughs> yeah. Does, does, like does clear all clear everything again? Let's yeah, see. It takes, no, that takes away all your adjustment brush pins. Uh, that would be bad. That'd be bad. I did all that work. Yeah. yeah. Room for improvement. Oh, well. That's good. They gotta have some, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so this this merged, and it looks like it ran out of memory before it could do the blend. So that's good. So let's deal with the real world <laughs> problem here. Let's first purge the cache. And it gets rid of that. And while I'm at it, I'm going to downsize this image a little bit just because I've got way too much. Like, this is only 20,000 mm. pixels. So if we were to look at that in terms of inches, <laughs> it would be a pretty big print. So I don't need big. So let's just simplify this. And I'm just going to drop this down to 50%. There we go. And I'll click OK and let it rebuild real quick. So. I opened up big raw files, which is not what you normally do for a demo on a webcast, but it's okay. And uh, that's it purging works. down. And uh, while that's done, you can invoke the blending manually. And so if it didn't do the blending for you, that's in the same place where Ron was talking about under the edit menu. Uh, you could see how these tiles are all overlapping there. And there's lines. So if we have those all selected, I could just say edit and I could choose auto blend layers and choose panorama and it's gonna go through. This is also useful if you've done a scan and you've had to scan an old photo in multiple parts and your scanner is a little lighter on the left side than it is on the right. Uh, it's a real fast easy way to go through and just sort of blend everything together. So once this is blended thinking, 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 go, <laughs> uh, then I could just merge it down. There we go. And you see it did a great job yeah. It went in and it detected all of those areas and fixed it. So that's pretty good. Technically, at this point, I would normally do a non-destructive workflow, but we're just going to be permanent here. I'll be, and I'm just going to merge those. So edit merge layers. And at this point, it's pretty simple. We'll do that adaptive wide angle filter and look at the image and try to find a horizon line. Now, it's a bit difficult in this image because there isn't a pure horizon line, but I can go off of this building here, and that is nice, and I'll just shift-click to force that, and yellow means it's close, so if I rotate that slightly, I should get green. There we go, and let's do one there. Shift-click to make that a vertical. It's confused. Rotate until it goes green, and using these different edges that are in my image, I can start to pick up strong areas that should influence the thing. So here's this great tower here. Grab that one, shift click to make it a vertical, and then manually dial it in until it snaps to the green. And it's going to favor for you. So that was pretty easy, right? And here's another good strong line. I can't shift click on that, but I can set that line and it picked up that as a vertical. And so you just look in the image and find a good few strong verticals or horizontals and it'll get you there. Is that part okay? Yeah, this is I mean that's a phenomenal tool. This is something you just you couldn't do in a dark room. You couldn't yeah. do this before this uh, the power of digital that we have currently. I mean, what we don't realize is the 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 pure processing power that's going behind this this uh this pano and into this wide adaptive wide angle is is uh, uh, intense. Yeah, and to finish it off, command click, select inverse, select modify expand twenty pixels, edit fill, content aware. Do the happy dance in just a second here. It's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. It's yeah. going to work because it's the demo god's work. Um, mm -hmm. And even if it's not perfect. 
it'll at least get that sky, but I'm usually amazed at how good it does on first glance. And I don't expect it to fill in these missing holes completely, because I can crop and everything else, but to be perfectly honest, that did pretty well. The bottom edge, not perfect, but the top edge, great. And so that did at least give me some flexibility to not have to crop as much. And now I've got a nice panorama. Excellent. I just want to bring up that uh, Jim in the chat uh, made a suggestion that might work really well is to yeah. create a preset all set to zero uh, in our yep. previous demonstration there. And that looks like it might be a good way to, to zero everything out all the time, just to go and hit your preset to zero. No, that absolutely makes sense. Definitely worth trying. Um, one other thing I love for panoramas is the photo filter adjustment layer. Do you guys use this one at all? It's one of those old school ones that most people forget about. So if you choose it, you've got simple presets that match glass yeah. ones for warming or cooling with a density slider. And I find that it's a really easy way, if you leave preserve luminosity checked, to just warm or cool a shot very quickly. And so you see there, it did a nice job of bringing out the blues. Sometimes once that's done, I'll pop the vibrance then and bring that out a little more. And then since you throw the color balance off, most people forget that when you toss on curves or levels, there's four or five different types of auto. Now, if you click auto, it guesses for you. But if you option or alt click on auto, you could choose to enhance just the black and white contrast, or to go one channel at a time while snapping all the neutral midtones, which is a great way to basically do a white and black balance after the fact. And so I was able to boost the blues, pop them again with vibrance, and then fix the color balance afterwards without really having to ever touch an adjustment. Just very quick, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, auto done. I'll have you know that that little trick right there, I, I think everybody watching just did that puppy dog strange noise look. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's option or alt click on auto, and you've got four methods plus snap neutral midtones, which are awesome to wow. fix things. And so, yeah, so like instead of curves, let's just do levels. Uh, sorry, let me click on the right one there. Levels, there we go. Uh, option click on auto. And again, there's the different methods. Oh, fix the monochrome contrast while snapping midtones to fix the white balance. And it automatically finds black and highlights and makes your white white and your blacks black. Wow. Find dark colors, fix brightness and contrast. They're all right there. It's very easy. I usually prefer per channel contrast with snap midtones as an easy way to go in and fix all three color channels while getting a clean black and white balance without having to ever touch a single slider. So what does it mean, Rich, when it says per channel? Does that mean it's doing it to all three channels? Is that what you're it's, saying? Yep, it's analyzing all three channels. So if you look at the actual adjustment here, you see here we could see the red channel. And if you look at those values, the green channel has different values, and the blue channel has a different value. So it essentially did three levels adjustments, a separate one for the red, green, and blue channel, balancing them out to basically get rid of the color cast. Fantastic. You are, you are like a master of masters. <laughs> that was <laughs> so obvious they make it so <laughs> and, and again, it's incredibly well hidden there, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> like, it, like Adobe does, they've made it in, incredibly apparent that everyone would just find that and use yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. They, they, they do a good job of hiding things. So uh, I, I want to respect time. i got plenty of stuff to show, but I don't know how long you guys want to run your show, and I don't want to be the only person talking either. So tell yeah. me what else you want to see. i got some Blur Lab stuff. we got a Cinemagraph. We've got... Uh, using the HDR toning option to add some texture to an image. What do you want to see? Yeah, why don't we finish off with a quick one, because we've gone past the hour now. So okay. we like to try and keep it around there. So if you have one quick one to end off the show, that would be awesome. All right, Blur Lab. Blur Lab is incredibly useful, and I like to use it for really bringing out details in an image. So first thing I'll do is I'll make this image a smart object, and then I'll just choose Blur Lab. And essentially, oh, sorry, you can't do a smart object. Undo, duplicate, there we go. Filter, Blur, 
and uh, I'm going to toss on the blur gallery here. And now there's five of these. There used to be three, and now they added spin blur and path blur in the newest update. So field blur is super simple. This allows you to basically do like a tilt shift blur. I'm sorry, uh, not a tilt shift, just field blurring. So let's set this to a low value. And I like this because I could drop a pin up here in the corner and crank it up, but then put another pin right here and set that value lower and then drop another one here. And it basically smoothly blends between each of those images or between each of those pins, I should say. And so if I put a pin here and turn that down, and you'll see as you drag those around how they sort of interact with each other. So it's easy for you to just use a series of pins to describe how you want the image to blur. Now, that's fun, and what I usually do is I'll save that to the channel. I'll explain why in a second. So another simple one would just be the iris blur. And you could adjust the size of that and the shape. Grab the handle here for roundness and you can move these pins around. And if you hold down the Option key, or the Alt key, you're detecting there's this great hidden key called Option or Alt after mm -hmm. tonight's presentation. Uh, you can actually move those pins independently of each other to control how much they blur. And so a lot of times, I'll say, save that mass to the channel and do that at high quality and click OK. Now, the reason why I did that is so I can come over here to Channels, command click to load on that and then just toss on an exposure adjustment so that I get a darkening at my blurred edge so it acts more like a vignette mm -hmm. and it really pulls things down so not only did it get blurry at the edges but it got darker and that's a really easy way to use that blur in the same method and as you're doing that it's kinda cool and then of course they've tossed in other effects so oops, filter Blur Gallery Tilt Shift allows you to just define what area is in focus and what area is out of focus. And you can move this line here for the transition. So that's nice to sort of have areas fall in and out of focus. And then they even added two new ones. Spin Blur is great if you're dealing with like automotive cars. And so you basically can set a wheel and crank up the amount and it's going to create basically a spinning object blurring. So it's not going to work for this image, but it's an easy way to simulate motion. But I do like path blur. And path blur is a bit obtuse, but it allows you to essentially draw a path. And as you pull this line out, it's essentially a highly customizable motion blur. And what I find is, is if you're trying to do a sort of streaking photography, you can actually have some fun with this, particularly if you taper the blur. And what I'll sometimes find is after I run that, I'll then just use that copy. Let's put that above here. There we go. And so we've got our blurred edges. There's this one. Let's just add a layer mask and blur that in. So we'll just put a little gradient blend. There we go. There's my darkening. And it's just fun ways to simply control focus after the fact. And it makes it really easy to just sort of control what part of the image is being seen. Well, thank you, Rich. That's so great. Hey, can you go back so we can see you? <laughs> so we can yeah, see you. absolutely. So uh, stop my screen sharing. And come on. Turn it off. There I am. And you're back. There we well, go. All I can say is if you could do that when you're injured, you know, I hate to see you when you're in 100% shape. <laughs> that was fantastic. I think you Thank feel you. better too, don't you? Yes, I was glad to actually have some social time that didn't involve staring at a bottle of Oxycontin. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to ask you, are you going to be, I guess Photoshop World is coming up uh, mm -hmm. September, beginning of September. Are you uh, uh, doing some stuff down there again this year? Yeah, I'll be speaking at Photoshop World. I missed it this spring because it was the exact same week as NAB, and I usually, uh, NAB is a big conference for the video industry that I chair a conference at, so that was the first Photoshop World I missed in 10 years, but I'm glad to be back. It's in Las Vegas the first week of September, and uh, I have a time-lapse workshop coming up. Um, also, uh, if you guys want, over at Photo Focus on the front page, 
Uh, we have a great Lightroom book that we're giving away for free until August 1st. So uh, Nicole S. Young, Rob Sylvan, Levi Sim all contributed to that. And so it's up there for free for about another week. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, that's great to, to put that out there. And are you doing something with, I saw with the drone thing, some kind of class somewhere uh, that I just saw? No, I, I've been talking about it. Russell's teaching a class at Photoshop World. Uh, I've been playing a lot with, with drones, mainly for video, but I'm playing with them for some photography. They did just release an update for the new uh, DJI Vision, so now you can shoot raw photos on a drone, which opens up some interesting things. So Adobe partnered with DJI, and so these helicopter cameras can now shoot a raw file to a DNG format, which introduces some... Because previously the cameras were crap. The angles were great. The cameras were crap. So now that we can do that, that opens up some really interesting possibilities. I've also been doing a lot of fun stuff with GoPro and time-lapse lately, um, long-term time-lapse installations. So it's so interesting how all this stuff comes together. And, and Jan, you have a nice outlet too. So I try to put anything I figure out uh, on lynda.com that has any value to folks. And then, of course... Uh, every day we're publishing stories to Photo Focus as well to try to help people out. So um, if I figure something out, as soon as I can get it written down or recorded, I put it out there. Great. Fantastic. Well, I, and I saw that Photo Focus is one of the uh, most valued photography websites by, who was it? Uh, Resource Magazine named us number one, which was quite the honor, so I was very happy. So, <laughs> can't complain. That was Thank you for that, Jen. No, I can't complain. That was a, that was a nice surprise and a nice honor. Um, Scott Bourne started PhotoFocus 15 years ago, and uh, last year Scott retired and uh, put the site in my hands along with Melissa New, who used to be with the Framed Awards. And uh, she and I have been working on it hard for the last year. We've expanded now to a writing force of 12 great folks, a lot of folks that you know quite well um, in the community. And it's just been a great platform that, you know, we put out about three stories every day. And we try to focus on original content. So it's not really a photo news site as much as a tutorial site. So if we do a review or we release news, it's usually our take or a tutorial how to use something. There's plenty of new sites out there. We try to avoid just regurgitating content. You know, that reminds me, and then I really do have to go. Um, uh, it's hard to find, but on lynda.com, there is an article site now, which is mm -hmm. similar to, I think, what you're talking about, and I've been writing articles whenever I get a chance, which yeah. isn't that often, you know, but there's such a huge library growing there. Um, hard to find, but boy, just go scroll through there. Yeah. And maybe, have you done stuff for them, too? I have. Is that the blog on lynda.com? I think it's just blog. It used to be the blog, but now it's an article site, so it's it's less okay. bloggy and more <laughs> concrete stuff. So it's cool. Okay. Good. Cool. All right, yep. guys, we gotta go because we all have um, you know real lives too. <laughs> thanks for thanks for having me on the show, guys, and uh, I'll get the replay out there to Photo Focus as well, so people can see it. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Awesome. We'll see you guys all later. Thanks. Thank you. Can I?